Um, so uh, really what we've been doing here uh, in the theory group is, is to have a series of conversations. Um, uh, what we're trying to do is to critically question the typical presentation that we get of social theorists, uh, such as the great classics, you know, dominant or Western thinkers by kind of comparing uh, these narratives with their biographies and self understandings. Um, but as a key part of that, we also want to show that social theory isn't really just uh, this kind of matter for these social, you know, these undergraduate introductions to sociology, uh, but to uh, uh, understand how these thinkers relate to contemporary issues, uh, including Black Lives Matter. Uh, um, so what have they said on race, identity, Brexit? Uh, and um, uh, what have they said about the complexity of modern society, uh, maybe even uh, things they've said that might fit with the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, so, for example, what might they have said on connectivity, social change and so on. So we've been trying to revisit these thinkers with this in mind. Uh, and the idea then is to give an opportunity to, 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 for people who come to present to promote their work. Uh, they can present some of their research. They can talk a little bit about the work that they're doing, uh, maybe offering links to a recently published book or paper. And today, uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing uh, uh, Matthias and Julian. Um, uh, Matthias uh, Benzer is a lecturer in sociology at the University of Sheffield. He was born and grew up in Western Austria, uh, uh, but moved to London in his late teens. Uh, and Matthias studied uh, sociology at the London School of Economics, uh, both as a, an undergraduate and a postgrad student. And then he completed his studies with a doctoral thesis on Theodore Adorno's sociological thought under the supervision of Nigel Dodd. Um, so Matthias uh, knows a little bit about uh, Adorno, I'm told. Uh, his work on Adorno includes a monograph, The Sociology of Theodore Adorno, uh, Cambridge University Press, as well as papers and chapters on different aspects of Adorno's sociology. Uh, Matthias has also written about other major interventions in the 20th and 21st century uh, social thought and has brought socio-theoretical debates to bear on questions in the sociology of health and illness. Uh, Julian Krauss is a policy associate and PhD researcher at the University of Southampton. Julian's academic roots are in philosophy, economics, social theory. Uh, he's already published wide, widely in leading journals such as the philosophy of the social sciences. Julian is also the co-editor-in-chief of the established philosophy journal Eventual Aesthetics. Uh, Julian, you can correct me if I've got that wrong, by the way. Uh, after deciding to change gears uh, some years ago, uh, Julian retrained as a computer scientist uh, and at present he's putting together his PhD in quantum computing, mm -hmm. quantum communication and security studies. Uh, and in his ongoing collaboration with Matthias, uh, Julian enjoys uh, writing on the Frankfurt School more than ever and remains an avid re re reader of contemporary sociology and in particular he's interested in the domains of science and technology studies at the intersections of technology and political power. Julian's major qualification to be speaking about Adorno today is that like Adorno he's from Frankfurt as well. Uh, now, last year, Matthias and Julian together published a piece on Adorno's sociology of conflict in a companion to Adorno, uh, published by Wiley Blackwell. And more recently still, uh, they are, have just completed an essay on the topic that concerns us today. And that is Adorno's examinations of right-wing extremism in the conditions of late capitalism. And this essay will be uh, published in the new Oxford handbook on Adorno which is due to be published by Oxford University Press later this year. So it forms the background uh, to uh, this uh, discussion. Now, I'm gonna kind of start the discussion by asking a question and then you'll see the screen change um, uh, as I kind of start uh, the kind of presentation. We only got a couple of slides, but it just is, is to act as a bit of color uh, to the background of the discussion as we move forward. 
So, uh, Matthias, uh, who was Adorno and why are his sociological writings still relevant today? Uh, Theodor Wiesengrund Adorno was born in 1903 in Frankfurt in the Second German Empire and died in 1969. In 1934, Adorno fled the Nazi regime and he subsequently spent almost two decades in emigration, first in England and then for much longer in America. Um, in the early 1950s, he returned to Germany and he lived and worked for the rest of his life back in uh, Frankfurt. Uh, Adorno was a musicologist, uh, aesthetic theorist, philosopher, and very importantly for our purposes, uh, a sociologist. Uh, he was one of the key figures in the Frankfurt School, so in critical theory, together with uh, Mark Torkheimer, Leo Löwenthal, Friedrich Bollock, Herbert Marcuse, Jürgen Habermas, and others. Uh, but perhaps the um, question of uh, contemporary relevance um, that you've just raised is much more important uh, than the biographical question. I suspect Julian would agree on this as well, Julian. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, ab absolutely. It is a fair question to ask, though, you know, why um, is this still relevant today? Um, after all, our chapter is based on this lecture uh, back in 1967, and in many ways, our social worlds are different today. However, uh, what we argue is that, you know, Adorno talks about really fundamental stuff, things and principles that uh, sit underneath a uh, surface phenomena, if you will. And that's still hugely really, really relevant for us today. So I think, you know, when it comes to what he has to offer on persistent structural inequalities in society, uh, the logic of um, late capitalism, and really importantly for our purposes today, you know, the principles of fascist propaganda, um, then Adorno has a lot to offer. So there are just so many uh, continuities that, that we find. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to concede absolutely that capitalism is this really dynamic and evolving thing, entity. It has undergone lots of uh, transformations uh, over the past decades. And I'm, you know, just thinking here of the emergence of the gig economy or the recent um, example of Wall Street. That's where retail investors on Reddit would have a go at you know, established hedge funds. Obviously, these are phenomena uh, that Adorno couldn't have written about. However, it, to us, it seems you know, pretty obvious that the underlying principles be, of capitalism have remained pretty much intact. You know? And I'm thinking here, just to finish that point in particular, about the logic, and ex the logic of exchange, the logic of profit, how political power operates, really to um, reproduce inequalities. Um, and the almost evangelical calling, right, to extract surplus wherever you could possibly find it. And this arguably has us propelled us into the current um, climate emergency. So long, long story short, I think if we want to diagnose capitalism at a really rich, deep and structural level, and, you know, a diagnosis that is conscious and mindful of uh, the historical um, conditions out of which capitalism continuously reemerges. Then I think the Frankfurt School, in general, and Adorno in particular, have a have a lot to offer in this space. So, long story short, really, uh, Adorno is relevant just because so many of the deep structural interdependencies that he talks about are still very much with us today. Yes, um, d'accord. And th th so there is this level of of late capitalism. Uh, but in addition, uh, what caught our attention relatively recently was uh, a new publication by Adorno in 2019, so 50 years after his death uh, in, uh, in Germany, entitled uh, Aspekte des neuen Rechtsradikalismus. I have the book here, actually. Uh, it's now also available in English, I think, um, with a similar cover, Aspects of the New Right-Wing Radicalism, I think is the English title. In any case, so this book is the transcript of a talk that Adorno gave in 1967, uh, not in Germany, in fact, but in, uh, at the University of Vienna. Uh, and the publication also contains a really insightful epilogue by um, uh, Volker Weiss, a historian and an expert on right-wing extremism. Uh, and as Weiss has pointed out, uh, Adorno gave this talk shortly after, uh, I think about three years after the foundation of the German right-wing political party, NPD, the National Democratic Party of Germany. Uh, and Adorno was trying to elucidate to a foreign audience essentially why this party had become so successful in Germany uh, in recent years. 
And what is crucial is that in doing so, and here Weiss and a lot of other people agree, Adorno problematized aspects of um, right-wing extremism back then that are very similar to aspects of right-wing extremism today, uh, including in many European countries and including uh, England, I would say. Uh, and by the way, this ties in with um, ongoing debates in the United States also at the moment, at this present time, where sociologists and philosophers have been examining the relevance of Adorno's much earlier analysis um, of American demagogueries, anal analysis from the 1940s, namely, uh, to coming to grips with the activities and appeal of the, well, latest former US president. Um, to mention just one example, two scholars, two American scholars, Havard and Halley, have recently shown how the former president uh, engaged in a kind of glorification of action in his speeches. And they showed that this glorification of action, which um, is noticeable in contemporary American authoritarian populism, is in turn what uh, the movement trick amounts to. And the movement trick is one of some 30 rhetorical tricks that uh, Adorno detected in American fascist rhetoric in the 1930s. Uh, Adorno's monograph on this, uh, originally written in English, by the way, and a very, very accessible uh, 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 read, uh, is called The Psychological Technique of Martin Luther Thomas's Radio Addresses. I'm just realizing that the title is probably not that accessible. It's a very long title, but, but the book is very accessible. Uh, and Julian and I, as we, as we were uh, beginning to explore these things or re-explore these things a little bit, uh, also came to the conviction that the Frankfurt School's massive uh, focus group study on German political consciousness, uh, which is entitled Group Experiment, and this has also been available in English. There is a Group Experiment uh, and Guilt and Defense volume. Uh, <clears throat> that these volumes also deal with problems that are quite comparable to problems familiar today. These are from the uh, mid, early mid 1950s. And both of these projects informed Adorno's um, 1967 piece on right-wing extremism that, that we came to focus on uh, in, in our recent discussions here tonight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, to me, it was almost a bit uncanny uh, to read the text of Adorno because it just seemed to have been you know, have been written with um, a lot of contemporary phenomena in mind. And he draws out a number of connections about you know, or what he has to offer you know, with regard to radical nationalism, uh, what it does to people, how it functions. But also, quite, quite curiously, uh, Adorno has a lot to say about the coupling, you know, the pairing of um, uh, fascist ideology and conspiracy tales. And obviously, at the moment, with uh, Annan, you know, um, that is obviously a very contemporary, very, very important uh, example. But he also talks about, um, at the time, a newly emerging hatred for supranational institutions. So the precursor to the EU was the EEC at the time, you know, and that was a target uh, of the right because it, you know, that body seemed to be threatening the very idea uh, of a nation state. And arguably, we have some continuities there as well. Yes, and, and, and what is absolutely decisive uh, for Adorno is that right-wing extremism and its whole success today, uh, and this is really what is so um, uh, uh, specific about his approach, is that all of these things must be examined in connection with the perpetuation of the social preconditions uh, of fascism. Uh, and by these uh, social preconditions, Adorno meant the basic conditions of late or of our current uh, capitalism. And so the consequence of this is that, uh, just as to add this, Barry, uh, to this response to your first question, the consequence of this is that, to, and I also want to underscore by this sort of the importance of the various levels that we've already named here, just in this first, uh, in this first consideration, is that the question of the relevance of Adorno's work on fascism to contemporary investigations of right-wing extremism and related phenomena, would be posed in a limited fashion if it were only a question about the resonances between what he observed and what is being observed today about such phenomena. And you, you would need, in order to pose this um, question concretely, need to um, pose it as the question of whether his examinations of fascism in connection with the dominant components of late capitalism are relevant for contemporary examinations of right-wing extremism view of these more per pervasive social relations. So this level cannot be disassociated from, from, from the uh, more empirical side of things. Okay, so um, what did uh, Adorno say specifically about capitalism that is relevant to this in particular? Well, 
if you start with a fundamental point, perhaps. So by 1967, so by the time he's he's uh, considering these uh, these new emerging phenomena in 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 in, in Germany in the sort of late 60s, mid late 60s, Adorno is firmly convinced that the class society that is late capitalism, the capitalism of his time, is characterized by the concentration and centralization of capital and by monopolies. Uh, already in 1957, uh, admittedly in a not particularly well-known, uh, uh, not very prominent piece called Teamwork in Social Research, um, uh, Adorno already says that if there was ever a blind market mechanism, an anonymous kind of market mechanism, like the liberal imagination, uh, then this mechanism is now, by the 1950s, in fact much earlier already, monopolistically damaged uh, by the concentration of capital in gigantic, uh, in this gigantic company. A decade earlier still, Adorno spoke of the era of economic concentration. So this was really important to him. And incidentally, this is quite well known, this conviction of Adorno's and people like George Cavalletto, Deborah Koch, Peter Uwe Hohendahl and others have discussed this uh, in quite in a bit of detail. Now, in the 1967 talk on right-wing extremism, Adorno once more comes back to this, and he pinpoints this ongoing tendency of capital to concentrate as a central sociological problem. And what he says here is this, for specific groups in society, concentration tendency of capital creates the risk of a declassing, so of a kind of social declassement or a social downgrading. Um, and these people who are at issue here, these people have typically understood themselves in their own class consciousness, as Adorno says here, they've understood themselves as bourgeois. And so, of course, these people don't want to lose their status. They don't want to lose their privileges. They don't want to slide downward. However, and this is decisive for Adorno, these people do not then proceed to blame their potential declassement on the concentration tendency that actually fuels it, uh, but instead, and this is where they are objectively wrong, but objectively they're being consistent with their class consciousness, uh, uh, one could say. They blame political opponents. And they blame political opponents of the very capitalist system that afforded them their status and their privilege in the first place. That is to say that Adorno emphasizes that these groups are often averse above all to socialism. So they will not be attracted to the uh, socialist project of transforming the capitalist condition. And this is one really important aspect for Adorno, because despite the growing unease in those people, this path to changing the fundamental social relations of capitalism is not um, a viable path on their intellectual map, if I may put it in slightly sort of unwieldy terms. Uh, but perhaps just to make this explicit as well, very briefly, Adorno emphasized as early as the 1940s uh, that attacks on communism, uh, or rather on a distorting image of communism, in the form of what he called at the time red baiting, have been quite typical of fascist uh, agitation also in America. And it is relevant perhaps here to remember that uh, Adorno already underscored back then that fascist demagogues painted a picture of communism as a threat to people's private property. And specifically, they painted a distorted picture of the sort of socialist advocacy for socializing the means of production in industry, so the industrial means of production, as instead a call to rob people, eh? people who don't have very much to start with, to rob them of their last modest possession, to confiscate what they have. And in fact, communists are even identified by some of these agitators as the potential cause of the very economic crisis that according to Marx's critique of political economy, as we know, develops from the capitalist mode of production itself. And again, you can find these considerations of Adorno's in, in, in the psychological technique of Martin Luther Thomas radio addresses that I've already mentioned. And there, so there's a real continuity uh, in his work here. There's a real continuity. I just want to quickly jump in here because Matthias raises such a hugely important point. Uh, so in Adorno, you know, we have this large group of people in late capitalism that constantly fear uh, their social economic relegation, if you will, no? uh, relegation to lower status. And that's arguably probably not much different today. Now, in this context, it's really important to note, however, that Adorno is not blaming the poor in any way, right? Uh, so he talks about people who, on whom that fear operates, but on, they are still privileged, uh, privileged people. Um, but there is now this specter of unemployment, right? And today, even more so, and you know, ideologies about you know, new liberalism, etc constant fear of losing your job and losing your home and I personally think the 2008 crisis still looms quite large. Right? 
Um, so importantly for Odona, really, these fears are absolutely justified, right? It's absolutely right to, to, to be um, worried about, about this. Um, but still, curiously, against the backdrop of this quite relentless pressure, uh, Adorno finds that people are not really looking for a utopian alternative, right? So that, as Matthias really points out, I pointed out just now, it's not turning into radical communists overnight that would want to free uh, the working class of uh, the shackles of capitalist production, really. So Adorno, that's where Adorno starts. Now he, he finds that many people just don't ask these big systemic questions. And Adorno thinks that mm, probably that's because many people are actually quite comfortable, mm -hmm. comfortable with the idea of a capitalist order. Um, they just want a better place in it, right? Uh, so what happens then in this dynamic is that when someone comes around and critiques the whole project, critiques the whole system, uh, that's the enemy, right? So pretty much they're shooting, shooting the critic, um, the critic, the critic of a system in which they want to be in a better position and get to a better place. So if we want to sort of dial this back a little and what does that mean for our purposes? I think thinking with Adorno here is about the present today, is about recognizing how the right and the extreme right operate and how um, they have become so attractive to many, for many, because in a way they keep that promise alive, yeah? Um, the promise of the system. So the system lets you down and it lets you down quite objectively, but somehow it's still good, right? Um, the, the reason that you're not doing better in the system is not systemic, it's also not your own fault, but that's then being projected onto other, other groups and uh, obviously underprivileged groups that are an easy target. So ethnic minorities, religious minorities, sexual minorities. So you know, personally, I like Adorno in particular for his dialectical take, right, on the status of victimhood among white privileged people uh, in a way that, you know, people who then turn to right wing populists. And yeah, yeah, on, you know, on some level, there are victims of capitalism too, but there's so much more, right? Um, there are the agents and bearers of their own oppression, if you will. Um, and this is where the, the notion of worth and value really uh, comes in. You know? I mean, if you lose your job because you no longer bring a value to the company, uh, that's a pretty obvious message that the system will send you, right? Um, and then along comes the fascist agitator who then appeals to a worth and a value that no matter what, uh, no process of declassing or uh, downgrading can ever possibly take away from you. Um, and that's an appeal to, to Germanness, to your Englishness, or to whatever national, nationality, right? Uh, or nationalism. Sorry, that was a long intervention. Yeah, no, absolutely. And to continue roughly along those lines, then, uh, another point that Julian has just broached, and maybe I can uh, un 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 unfold this a little bit. Adorno admits in, in 1960s Germany that people are witnessing virtually full employment, uh, a series of what he calls um, symptoms of prosperity. But what uh, these things have not managed to do is they haven't managed to get rid of this specter of technological employment. This continues to spook people. Yeah? And so in the era of this general automatization, even people who are at work, this is Adorno's diagnosis, feel that they could soon be without work and that they could in fact be done without. And this was a lingering concern of his, right? Already at the end of the 1950s, in a much more widely uh, known talk uh, on this issue of Germany's effort to work through the Nazi past, Adorno is saying, well, look, this feeling of being potentially superfluous is a perfectly reasonable motivation for a certain discomfort in people at the prosperity of the post-war decades, a certain unease uh, in people, and that this discomfort could be abused uh, for a renewal of the calamities of the very recent past at that time. Uh, maybe there is time at the end to, do, to, to, to perhaps develop this a little bit. But anyway, and to refer to another point of Adorno's, and again, uh, this is all, resonates very strongly with something Julian has already said, um, and it is also relevant to the question here, and it's a really noteworthy point also uh, in this country and at this juncture uh, of European history, 
So we could say that, um, if you like, Adorno's previous two points uh, uh, about the concentration of capital and about uh, uh, technological unemployment are essentially about uh, the relations of production as property relations and about the forces of production. So if you want to think in these uh, 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 Marxist uh, terms. Uh, but what's important to say also is that for Adorno, he's writing, of course, in the mid 20th century, not in the 19th century, uh, these relations of production comprise both property relations, uh, as we already know, and uh, as Adorno says, the relations of administration. And so in aspects of the new right-wing radicalism, Adorno now specifies the present epoch as the epoch of the massive power blocks. And in this context, uh, Adorno again highlights that people develop this fear that they might experience a worsening of their material situation. So again, he's not focusing on people who are actually experiencing poverty at that point, but people who think they might. Uh, uh, for instance, and it's really, I find this remarkable that Adorno already begins to pick up on these issues that are so much more visible today. Uh, so people in the agrarian sector of the 1960s, he says, develop a fear of, this consequen of the consequences of the European economic community for the agrarian market. And he says that in the eyes of the people that have to live in these power blocks that are forming at the time, nationalism is still an instrument for representing their own interests in turn. But at the same time, Adorno highlights, of course, that this nationalism has something paradoxical, he even says antagonistic, because precisely when nations are integrated into huge power blocks, each nation alone, has less and less room for maneuver. And so nationalism becomes something slightly fictitious as well. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, Adorno says, nobody really believes this anymore. Nobody is really a really truly committed nationalist in the sense of believing it. But, and here is the, uh, here's the paradox, and also the danger of nationalism emerging as a result, this form of nationalism, because it is precisely, of course, people's doubts with no longer quite believing it, that, though so Adorno claims, requires people who are attracted to nationalism to in fact overplay or exaggerate their nationalism. So nationalism becomes more pronounced, more stubborn, precisely at the time at which it is no longer quite so credible. And incidentally, Adorno picked up um, here on a remark he made much earlier in the Stars Down to Earth, uh, which is his sociological analysis of astrology, uh, which is quite well known. I can show the book here as well. Uh, <laughs> happen to have these lying around here. Uh, uh, and the remark that he makes in there is that what you can find across different mass movements of various types is that people may not entirely believe in the notions that they pretend to believe in, but that for this very reason, they overdo their beliefs. And as he adds in the Dance Down to Earth, they might then quite quickly proceed to violence because of this exaggerated uh, uh, adherence to these. I think these are some of the major components uh, in immediate uh, response to your question, Barry. <clears throat> Interesting. Um, now, in, the, in, in your answer uh, to that question, you were talking about productive forces. Um, and one of the things that is very prominent in relation to white ring, what right wing extremism today is, is really the uh, use of kind of social media uh, maybe even AI and automation. How can Adorno's work inform our analysis of technology uh, yes. in relation to this? This is such a great question and such a big one too. Uh, if I could just uh, make, make a start here. I, I think for, for Adorno, technology is a big, big accelerator. Right? I mean, there is huge, tremendous potential for technology to make things better. In reality, however, it will also help make things uh, worse. And, you know, in a sense, then there is nothing intrinsically good or bad about AI, automation, social media. It depends, obviously, on what you do with it. And to anyone uh, in this meeting who's ever read Adorno, uh, it really should come uh, no surprise, no surprise that for Adorno, what you can do with it is what capitalism affords. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So in, in Adorno's terms, more than ever are the social relations of production decisive for what happens with and in the forces of production. So this is where he departs, he says, from earlier sociology, from people like August Kant, from uh, certainly also uh, uh, some parts of Marx's work, the passages in the manifesto, uh, 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 this, this uh, predominance of the social relations of production this is really important. Sorry, uh, Julian, I interrupted, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, I just want to develop that perhaps a bit 
a bit more, you know, I've just been thinking about um, sometimes you get just really well-meaning people who would express their disgust at, you know, the likes, say the founders of Amazon or Tesla, you know, and how much wealth they have accumulated, um, you know, and how, how their combined wealth uh, would really lift several uh, so-called developing countries out of poverty uh, pretty much immediately, right? So then they go, oh, this is obscene. Uh, we need to regulate this better. And it just shows how greedy people are. And if only people were not so greedy, et cetera. Um, and an, an appeal to change behavior. Uh, but for Adorno, that's not a really good, that's not a good argument. It's not an aberration in capitalism, right? It's just a logical consequence. So if it hadn't been for Amazon to, for instance, to exploit uh, new web-based technologies at the time, it would have been someone someone else. Um, and that's really important for thinking about how the right operates. Um, really important that for Adorno, you know, technology just can't possibly transcend property rights. Uh, and what I mean by that, if you, I guess, the history of the internet and the web uh, it's probably a good, good example of this, right? Um, let me quickly elaborate on, on this a little bit. So if you go back to texts from the 1970s, 1980s, um, utopian texts, you know, uh, how a future network society will look like, how it will revolutionize the world. Uh, frankly, it's mind boggling, you know? This technology will do away with all sorts of inequality. Um, so in that, in the dreams of the 70s and 80s about the next work future, uh, there were just no racial inequalities and injustices at all, and no discrimination on the grounds of gender or disability, because everyone would be connected with everyone else, you know, in the comfort of their home. Um, it's this radically flat, radically egalitarian society. And, you know, arguably now that we are all working in the uh, comfort of our home, uh, we, we see that this didn't quite work out that way, did it? Uh, and we probably even didn't need uh, the current global COVID pandemic to, to say that this didn't quite work out. So yes, a lot of great things have happened, uh, but you know, big tech happened too, and a lot of exacerbation of, of inequality. Now, in that, so going back to that book that uh, Matthias and I are discussing in our chapter, right? I, I don't know talks about that fear of automation that Matthias has mentioned uh, just now. So this, this fear that the robot could replace you, and that's now some sort of constant background noise. Um, Adorno's was thinking here, I would say, is uh, quite Marxist in a way, you know, uh, essentially Marxist in that capitalism is this contradictory affair. You, there is, you require technological progress to maintain a competitive edge over your rivals and other players. And that then sees to the development and obviously deployment of ever more efficient machines uh, that replace workers, make them redundant, and that puts additional pressure on the system from within and destabilize the whole uh, system from, from within. Um, and arguably, that is much more an issue today than it was back then for Adorno. Uh, estimates suggest I mean, there's serious work out there um, that considers that in the not so distant future, uh, large groups of people in retail, uh, logistics, transport uh, will lose their job, right? And now again, this is a great example of how, um, what we were saying earlier about how fascist agitators work and how they want to leave systemic principles intact. Um, it's, it's, I don't think it's coincidence that some of you will have heard about the great replacement story and how it has come back with a vengeance over the past couple of years, right? I mean, the story, uh, this conspiracy that, um, the conspiracy tale that the good, white, decent people of the West uh, are to be replaced in the commas by, you know, um, Michael. So this crazy story that there is this elite uh, that fabricates this, and there is this replacement going on. So the white West is, in that story under existential threat. And, and Adorno would probably say it's curious that, you know, there is probably nothing you can do about a fearing replacement by the robot 
but you can still hate other people, right? Uh, so again, here for the fascists, then it's not the system uh, that's at fault, but other groups of people uh, where the blame lies, you know, and that's where it gets genocidal really quickly, because if only these groups didn't exist, then we would all live quite happily and importantly quite quite well and affluent, affluent under under capitalism. And just to as an example of how dangerous that is, you know, today actually today is the anniversary of the worst right wing uh, shooting in Germany since uh, since the war. Uh, exactly today, one year ago, um, uh, a shooter in the town of Hanau was looking for people he deemed foreign looking. Uh, he was a great believer of that replacement story and he walked into a local shisha bar, uh, shot and killed 10 people. Um, sorry, just I, I'll finish here, it's, uh, just, just briefly um, to, to wrap up this point. Um, anyone on this, in this meeting, I think, who's ever been to a Marxist reading group, say, you know? uh, and you might remember how much arguing there was, how much debate there was, and, how difficult it is to develop this perspective on or reflect on the system from within the system. You know, it's really hard work. I would argue that comparably or relatively the agitators, the right-wing fascist agitators have it easier. So a simple catchy propaganda that you can disseminate on social media very quickly. Uh, it gets, it you know, provides a dopamine kick every time with each click. Um, but to get that level of engagement and excitement going, and the technology lends itself for that, um, the message needs to get louder and shriller every time to create that, that effect. So what you find today is this really bizarre um, mix of people. And I think we have a slide for this. The very last slide, I think, uh, is, is a picture from one of these rallies they had in, in, in Berlin recently. You know, it's a sort of a, a mix and melange of right wing uh, extremists and conspiracy tales and anti-science and crude esotericism, anti-Semitism, obviously, and outright madness um, that's going on there. So, and just to finish that point, sorry. For Adorno, importantly, these are not independent phenomena, but they all sit on a continuum. Uh, and we should also then, you know, analyze them as such. Thanks. Uh, so that's yeah. an answer to your question, Barry. Uh, yeah. What to think about technology uh, sociologically. So, so uh, one of the things that springs to mind when I'm, I'm listening to this, because there's a lot of current discussion and debate uh, around, um, for example, rentier capitalism, some of the debates in economics about inequality and widening inequality. Um, how do you think all of this links uh, to debates in economics uh, about rentier capitalism? So we're thinking of Brett Christopher's book, on rentier capitalism, Thomas Piketty, and so on. Mm, yeah, that's a, uh, a good one. Um, I would say that broadly speaking, very broadly speaking, we would find support for this line of work in, in Adorno, uh, probably in particular regarding Piketty. Um, so, you know, there is, yeah, uh, there is debate uh, around his statistics. Um, but I think Piketty has demonstrated quite, quite robustly in this big successful book of his that over the past 250 years, there simply has been no self-correcting mechanism in capitalism that would help us tackle inequality. Uh, so what he did essentially was he, you know, he, uh, he finds that uh, capital returns persistently outperform economic growth rates. Uh, and that just means that if you own capital, you get richer faster relatively you know, compared to, to the rest of the, of the population. Uh, so over time, that just leads to this widening gap and this increase in inequality uh, between, between groups. And this is a very self-perpetuating uh, process and probably a more sophisticated way of talking about these things than Adorno's, who wasn't um, a trained statistician, but probably, you know, his what he is saying about the concentration of capital is goes, goes in a similar, similar direction. I think with regard to rentier capitalism, uh, the picture is probably a bit more mixed, I would think, in that mm, Adorno would certainly concede uh, that it's absolutely evidently true that in capitalism you have these rent seekers 
and that they wish to extract maximum surplus, right, while giving back as little as they possibly can, uh, if possible, give nothing back at all. But Adorno would probably say that's not necessarily a new thing. It's where you end up uh, if and when you uh, let capitalism run its course. So I think he would warn us also against placing too much emphasis on certain elite groups um, at the expense of, say, a more structural analysis. Because for Adorno, at the end, the elite does what it does because it can, right? Um, and the moment we just over identify certain groups of people or individuals that are the source of all evil, you know, I guess we get into a pretty dangerous territory. So uh, this would be my um, immediate yeah. thing to that. Okay, we're, we're running really short on time here. So um, uh, there's just one thing I would like to ask really to sum up so then we can open up to some discussion today. Um, uh, where does this really leave us in relation to right wing, right wing extremism and, and uh, how should sociology really be responding? Well, to my mind, I don't know sociological writings would suggest, suggest that contemporary sociology should grasp this problem of extremism, not just as an outlier eh? or precisely not as an extreme in that sense, but that extremism needs to be grasped in close relation to the dominant uh, social conditions of late capitalism. And when you say in close relation to, then I think Adorno would probably want this to be understood in two ways. Firstly, uh, and this is what we have been speaking about really for the last half hour, uh, it is of course the case that um, late capitalism in these different ways can foster and foment uh, uh, right-wing extremism. Uh, but also, secondly, the rise of right-wing extremism has implications for late capitalist conditions as a whole, um, or even for humanity as a whole. So I don't was no doubt about, about the dangers of this. Um, a really striking illustration, again, of, of, of this view of Adorno's uh, can be found in his in this aspects talk that I was referring earlier, namely in his discussion of quite strange, at first sight, quite strange longing for destruction among right-wing extremists. If you go back a couple of decades further again to the 1940s, now Adorno is studying American fascist agitators when he's in exile, and he says, well, I'm observing here that these agitators and their listeners are getting excited by the notion of an unavoidable disaster. And that, in fact, they were getting excited not only about the notion of the destruction of whoever they consider to be their enemy, but also getting excited, really excited about this notion of self-destruction. Huh? And at the same time, Adorno was already then able to amplify references in these um, in this uh, 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 agitation material to an imminent sort of world calamity, uh, a sort of all-encompassing disaster. Uh, uh, and there are discussions of this already. Again, uh, I, I refer to George Cavietto and people like that who've discussed these writings. But now, if we go back forward a couple of decades to 1967. Uh, aspects of new right-wing radicalism, then Adorno says this, and this does resonate with the early considerations, but also uh, it shows that the right is now taking a further step here, as it were, a further step in that direction. Fascist movement now, says Adorno, want a catastrophe. But they appeal, uh, he says, to an unconscious uh, desire for calamity. But this longing that Adorno is now emphasizing is no longer just a longing for the downfall uh, or the uh, uh, end uh, uh, or the collapse of a defined enemy or even just of myself, but the collapse of the whole. They want the death of everything. So these are, as he says, end of the world fantasies. Yeah? Now it doesn't need to be spelled out obviously that the prevalence of such fantasies potentially has consequences for society as a whole. This is a, 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 a very dangerous kind of uh, mindset. But again, from the other side, what Adorno is also arguing is that some people actually no longer have much of an alternative to the desire for total disaster. Why? Because on the one hand, these people are, uh, as we've already mentioned, basically averse to uh, any kind of idea of transforming the social whole, of changing the social basis, as Adorno puts it. While on the other hand, uh, they see no future within the social whole, within society as it is and continues either. Rather, they now are sort of compelled to constantly ask themselves this question, how is all of this supposed to go on? How can this go on? How can this be sustained when the next big crisis hits? You can hear here with the notion of go on, right? You can clearly hear here also the resonance with Adorno's reading of his, uh, his favorite Irish author, Samuel Beckett. Eh? Uh, 
and I think that for a donor scholarship, it would be actually really interesting to amplify these a little bit. Um, for example, he speaks in aspect, when he speaks about these problems, of a crippled and false consciousness. Uh, and he says that people here are already sort of discounting the economic setback. And in, in the Beckett uh, uh, writings, he says, the Beckett's dramatist persona, Beckett put this on stage in a sense, right? His dramatist persona dream of their own death in Endgame. They discount the end of the world. They have a bombed out consciousness. These are sort of Adonis uh, formulations. But in any case, people's doubts about the system, this how can this all continue? Adorno traces this in turn back to people's social situation. So the tendency towards immiseration and the ongoing tendency, again, of capital to concentrate uh, in late capitalism. And Adorno is adamant that the social relations of production and people's fears of the consequences of development in society as a whole are ultimately behind the fact that we find uh, fascism, people who follow fascism, with all that this implies, uh, in almost every sector of the population. So not only in some sectors, certainly not like the petite bourgeoisie or certainly not uh, uh, in the most disadvantaged sectors, but almost everywhere. And sociology taking inspiration from Adorno would make the attempt to capture these extreme aspects of extremism. So the extreme of the extreme, but it would also need to master this task of deciphering these attempts, um, uh, the, these aspects uh, uh, for their own uh, social context. So what this means is elucidating these, not just as something extreme, not just as an outlier, but in view of social conditions that are much more vi widely prevalent. So in view of the basic social relationships that organize uh, the way in which we all live and die uh, uh, today. Uh, that, that, would be the, that would be the sort of methodological method message, if you like, from Adorno's uh, sociological writings in this area. I'll just keep this really brief in the interest of yeah. time uh, and because oh, Matthias, yeah. and I, I, what could I possibly add to Matthias's wonderful words here? But, um, you know, thinking with Adorno in terms of doing sociology, I think invites us really to um, try and trace and reflect on the large complex formations that maybe you know, sit behind some concrete uh, social phenomena that we're looking at. Um, so, you know, in sociology 101, we all learned that everything is connected with everything else. But the really big, big question is how so, you know? And to me, Adorno, Adorno's work is a reminder to respond to that question. So no matter if you call it the social whole, the totality, capitalism, uh, you know, the way things hang together, um, Adorno is quite adamant that that will never reveal itself completely in just purely intellectual musings or concept making, but crucially, uh, aspects and glimpses of this capitalist order will necessarily shine through um, in whatever we do and whatever we study. And how could that be, could be any different? So just as an inspiration for sociology, I think, uh, thinking with Adorno would mean to try and map these different connections between what appears uh, separate to be separate phenomena, uh, but are probably not. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I could get rid of uh, my my screen and we're going to open up to any uh, any questions that people have. Um, uh, so uh, has anybody any questions they'd like to ask? You can put them into the chat or you can um, uh, unmute your mic and have, have a chat. Uh, remember we're recording uh, today so Right, there we go. So in the chat, uh, let me see if I can get it up. Um, is anybody, any particular things they'd like to say? So we've got, thanks for the talk. Uh, really good to see how Ordorno's sociological thoughts are still relevant today, especially in relation to nationalism and capitalism. Given the fact that Adorno spent time in the US and perhaps aware of black struggles in the United States, I wonder whether it's possible to read Adorno through racial capitalism that underpins the social and economic difference between whites and non-whites. Uh, yes, um, there, there is work, work on this is actually ongoing at the moment in, in Adorno scholarship. Um, I mean, perhaps this, I would first of all say something that was recently said by, um, Anisha Sankar in a paper, it's not about, the paper is not about Adorno, it's about Franz Fanon and uh, Walter Benjamin. Um, 
Benjamin, of course, being a thinker very close in all sorts of ways to Adorno. And Sanka says rightly, in my view, that uh, 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 people who are interested in, 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 in the relationships between uh, 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 white people and non-white people, uh, people like Fanon, um, uh, do not require European thinkers to be legitimated, of course. Um, and, and we can extend this and say, Adorno might not be required for, for, for that analytical project. But the reverse question, whether Adorno's work would gain great legitimacy, let's say through uh, um, uh, his own ability to contribute to this, that I think is a serious question um, because, um, and, and I think that's where the question is heading. Um, and I think there are several points one could make. So on a sort of larger, larger, uh, a more abstract uh, level, um, Adorno, of course, uh, is a, a theorist who analyzed racism uh, uh, and capitalism uh, and racism in capitalism. Uh, and this, this is obviously well known. Uh, and many uh, Adorno scholars have pointed this out. For example, recently, Marcel Stetzer, a really good paper on uh, static and dynamic in the journal of capitalism. And this is, ideas, this is Adorno's idea that there is an intrinsic connection between the conditions of abstract labor, the, the, the conception of abstract labor and racism and that this reduction uh, tied into the identity principle is encapsulated by both. Um, but I'm sure that th that sort of doesn't really need to be rehearsed. But what I think is, is, is really interesting is something that came up when I was reading uh, um, the group experiment study. So the guilt and defense and, 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 and the group experiment study. And what he's saying there is, Adorno says, okay, he's, he's researching uh, in the group experiment in this study, he's researching in a focus group uh, the political consciousness of German people in the early 1950s, right? And what comes up here at the time, of course, the world is looking at Germany and is saying to Germany, look what you guys have done. And in a discussion amongst participants in this focus group, so the study subjects, um, one of the participants or several of the participants began begin to argue that Americans, I'm paraphrasing, Americans are in no position to reprimand the Germans for the Holocaust because in the southern states, white Americans are lynching black people. And so Adorno's research on fascism picks up uh, on these con constructs and he shows this. He says, firstly, how white people, in this case, German white people, seek to silence those that point out the genocide committed by Germany. And secondly, how these same white people instrumentalize the suffering and death of black people at the hand of other, uh, in this case, American white people for that purpose. And I think that such utterances are noteworthy, right? Not because examining them contributes any novel insights necessarily into American white racist violence against black people, because it doesn't, it, it is not a central theme in Adorno's work, but it does offer an insight into how some white people treat the victims of other white people's racist violence. And so here this violence is not at all treated as something uh, by these study subjects. Uh, the study subjects don't treat this violence as something that must be condemned or prevented, but instead in a sort of reification or a second reification to be precise of the victims, the victims of the racist violence of American white people and the violence itself are turned by the German white people into mere means to their own uh, kind of sufficiently sinister political ends. So there's a second reification going on. Now this I think is interesting in terms uh, of what we can unearth from Adorno's, um, Adorno's work about the relationship of um, uh, uh, white and non-white people uh, in America and, or, and, and more generally. Um, so it's, these, it's, it's in the subtleties, it's in the nooks and crannies, I think, that, that, where it is. So we have another question, uh, yep. Julian, uh, maybe you can handle this one. Um, so it's from Christian, great discussion. Uh, I, I have a question on the wider application of Adorno's idea. We're running out of time, by the way, so we have to. Um, um, the system lets you down, which is directed at other groups, leading in turn to right-wing extremism. But isn't that the same pattern for left-wing extremism? The German RAF also argued that the problem is in the system and pointed at the privileged elites. Is he actually providing a more general model of extremist logics that could be applied to the wider area of extremism, fundamentalism, and terrorism? Uh, yes, but with a twist. <laughs> so yes, it is a more uh, general model in my view, uh, but because Adorno was certainly quite um, dubious about uh, communist credentials by uh, many self-claimed radical thinkers in the late 60s, and I was with particular students' movement um, 
and the call to action in where he obviously not with everyone, not everyone in that group, but he, he identified a certain aversion to concept making, to thinking, to theory making, you know, it was all about what, oh, we don't need this theory, we need action, right? And uh, Adorno was very dubious about that logic that operates behind that. So yes, in a way, it would be a more general model, but for Adorno, he would probably try and unpack uh, claims that say, oh, well, I'm super radically communist and left, and would probably try and prove that in actual fact, there are, you know, fascist tendencies in, in ways of thinking at least, right? Um, so arguably I would, maybe Matthias disagrees, but I think he would try and bring this back to his analysis of um, how, you know, the fascist logic works. Very good, okay. Do we have any, oh, we have another. Um, uh, sorry that people have had to go because uh, we're coming up against uh, the time deadline. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to say or any other questions? We, we're running out of time. Only great great also, question, if, by the way. A great question, if I didn't way. answer the question, the first question, I'm happy to elaborate as well if I didn't answer the first uh, yeah, question. Yeah, me, me too. Or Matthias, do you want to? Don't be shy. They're quite friendly, these two, you know. Particularly on a Friday. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that'll do then. Um, I think I'll stop the recording. Um, thank, you. thank you, everyone, um, for uh, coming along. Uh, and uh, uh, you will see the recording of this um, up on uh, the website, and we will be tweeting about it. So feel free to join in in the discussion beyond this meeting uh, and uh, to raise any further questions on social media. Um, we can use the technology positively too. All right. Thank you, everybody.